prior to Operation Crusader, which will start next episode, there were three important preliminary operations that either impacted or could have impacted the course of not just Crusader, but the whole of the North African campaign, and maybe the war itself. The first mission ever by the SAS, a raid by Rommel into Egypt, and an assassination attempt on Rommel's life. Let's take a look at all of these today. Notes and sources will be in the pinned comment. Timestamps to various parts of the video will be in the description. Rommel went to see Hitler at the Wolf's Lair in late July 1941. Hitler showed him maps of the Eastern Front, where Soviet armies were getting chewed up by German encirclements. It was obvious now why Rommel wouldn't be receiving any more reinforcements in Africa. Nonetheless, Rommel left the Wolfschanze feeling revitalised, as he always did after spending time in the Führer's presence. Nearly two more years would have to pass before the power of Hitler's charm finally wore thin enough for Rommel to see through it. Just prior to his flight back to North Africa in August, Rommel noticed that his eyes and skin were turning yellowish. This was the first signs of jaundice. He said nothing, knowing that he may not be permitted to fly back to North Africa. When he did get back, the Africa Corps doctors prescribed him a bland diet and ordered him to rest. He obeyed the first instruction and defied the second. And while this was typical of Rommel, it weakened his constitution. He now spent most of the August, September and October with the same sort of gastric disorders that afflicted a lot of the Germans in North Africa. But Rommel couldn't rest, because now he had an obsession. Tobruk. He had to take Tobruk. So he announced that he wanted to capture the ports before the end of the year. If he could take Tobruk, it's possible that a new offensive into Egypt could be started in February of 1942. Rommel is fixated on this idea, and says that he needs all the forces they can spare in North Africa for this attack, as well as more equipment, ammunition, fuel and rations. General Bastico was sceptical of Rommel's intention to take Tobruk, thinking it was an unhealthy obsession. Realistically, the attack could not take place before the beginning of October at the earliest, and they couldn't start an attack unless they knew the British weren't going to hit them in the rear. If Axis forces were assaulting Tobruk, and the British did strike them from behind, they'd most certainly be at a disadvantage. Therefore, they needed to know for certain that there wasn't going to be a new British offensive from the frontier. 3rd and 33rd Reconnaissance Battalions kept an eye on the area between Solemn and Sidi Omar, as well as the flank to the south. But from July, the armoured cars of the 11th Hussars, supported by the 4th Battalion of the South African Armoured Car Regiment, and some of the Jock Columns, were now reducing the effectiveness of German reconnaissance operations. The RAF were also strengthened, effectively blinding the Germans to British intentions beyond the frontier. Rommel's intelligence suggested a British attack was coming, and he suspected that the aim was to relieve Tobruk. However, with their own intelligence gathering hindered, it now became important that the Germans figure out what the British were up to. By early September, he and the equally eager von Ravenstein had, between them, concocted a plan for a raid along the edge of the escarpment towards what intelligence believed to be a large British supply dump, possibly set up in preparation for a future attack. In late August, reports from von Melithin as well as the Abwehr told Rommel that the British were organising an offensive. They then found out about a supply dump at Bur el Hirigat. On the 27th of August, Rommel therefore orders a raid to be planned to take it out so as to find out what was going on. This was the beginning of Operation Sommersnacht Strom, Summer's Night's Dream. 21st Panzer Division planned to cross the frontier with fighter and Stuka support, strike towards the British supply dump, and see if they could figure out if the British were planning to attack or not. The attack would take place on the 14th of September, when the moon would be suitable. However, as the date came nearer, the Germans realised that the supply dump was a disused one. So, instead of targeting the dump, 
Rommel decided to change the mission to simply raid and destroy British forces to the east of Burhel Hirigat, and destroy any forward British supply dumps that they happened to come across. The ultimate goal was to figure out if the British really were planning an attack. 21st Panzer Division formed three Kampfgruppen, or battle groups, for the raid. The first was Kampfgruppe Stefan, which was basically 5th Panzer Regiment. The second was Kampfgruppe Schutter, consisting of 8th Machine Gun Battalion, 602nd Panzer Jäger Battalion, 1st Battery of the 33rd Artillery Regiment, and a platoon from the 606th Flak Battalion. The third was Kampfgruppe Panzerhagen, led by Major Panzerhagen. The main element of this unit was the 3rd Battalion of the 347th Infantry Regiment of the Africa Division. 3rd Reconnaissance Battalion was also ordered to move along the wire in order to raise as much dust as possible. This would make it look like the entire Africa Corps was on the move. But British intelligence had warned Auchinleck about Rommel's intentions, so he was able to plan accordingly. Campbell's 7th Support Group stood in their way. Campbell was ordered not to get into a fight, and several documents were created to deliberately deceive the Germans should they accidentally fall into German hands. So, on the 14th of September 1941, Summer's Night's Dream began. 21st Panzer Division moved through and past the solemn city Omar line into Egypt. Their attack was quickly detected by British armoured cars. It was then hit by artillery and air attacks. Campbell's 7th Support Group withdrew, preventing the Germans from achieving anything of note. Rommel accompanied the Northern Column, which was Kampfgruppe Schutter. Kampfgruppe Schutter moved along the line of the escarpment and advanced to Ikwere el Ruibit, engaging British armoured cars. Flat guns knocked out two of them and forced the remainder to pull back. Kampfgruppe Stefan moved along the Burr Shafurzin el Hamra track and took Deir el Hamra. It also knocked out several enemy tanks and chased other units away. Kampfgruppe Panzerhagen advanced on the southern flank. By midday, the Panzers had closed around the expected dump and found little of any use. However, they did capture a lorry that ended up being the orderly room and staff for the 4th Battalion of the South African Armoured Car Regiment. The lorry was full of quite important documents and cipher material, which von Ravenstein delightedly declared a prize quite sufficient to justify the raid on its own. Rommel was not happy with just this prize, however, and so ordered the Panzers to drive deeper. The first two Kampfgruppen were stalled by the armoured cars and the jock columns of the 7th Support Group, then ran out of fuel. In the following artillery bombardment, Rommel's driver was killed, and Rommel lost the heel of his boot. But Panzerhagen's force continued on. Panzerhagen's men fought off some enemy armoured cars, and both sides took casualties. That night, Panzerhagen formed a hedgehog defence, which proved to be the correct strategy because they were attacked by enemy armoured cars and infantry twice. Both attacks were beaten off by machine gun and flak fire. The next day, Panzerhagen's force was ordered to pull back to its starting point. And as Rommel's forces fell back on the 16th of September, the RAF hit the German columns, inflicting several losses, including Rommel's own mammoth truck. For some hours, Lieutenant Schmidt struggled to change the flat tyre, as the radio operator listened to the British signals traffic. They knew that 7th support group were getting closer, and closer. Rommel didn't send out a cry for help over the radio because he had enough respect for the 11th Hussars to know that they would exploit the situation. But in the nick of time, they managed to get the wheel fixed, and Rommel drove himself back to the frontier. It was a short raid. British losses were 15 men, 1 armoured car, and 7 aircraft. The Germans lost 56 men, 9 aircraft destroyed or damaged, and 5 tanks abandoned. However, German records also show that the number of fit tanks in 21st Panzer Division dropped from 110 on the 11th of September to 43 on the 20th. But the Germans did recover their losses from the raid by the 12th of November. So the raid had affected the German tanks, but the Germans were only listing the number of fit tanks, which means it's hard to tell exactly how many tanks they'd lost in this action. 
If, hypothetically, they had had a hundred tanks, lost 50 of them during the combat, but repaired them all by the end of the day, their records would show that they didn't lose a single tank. This proves that the German records aren't super reliable since they're not showing the exact losses suffered in combat, and it's worth bearing this in mind when we get into the Crusader battle next week. Overall, this attack had been a complete waste of time. No sign of a British build-up was found, and no supply dumps had been taken. However, the planted documents that the Germans had captured suggested that the British weren't going to launch an attack until December, and were even considering making a retreat to the Mersa-Matra area. Rommel left Egypt with the view that the British weren't going to be a threat to him in the near future. So convincing were these planted documents that Rommel would actually be on his way back from Rome, where he had gone on November 1st to spend two weeks of leave with Lucy when the British attack was sprung. Auchinleck had successfully concealed the British build-up, which was going on just a few miles further east than where Rommel had moved. So, thinking that the British wouldn't be able to attack for a while, Rommel concluded that Tobruk should remain the main goal. He dismissed Hal Derp's and Bastico's warnings that the British might be gearing up for an attack, and believed that the main enemy were the Australians in Tobruk. Of course, the reality was that Auchinleck's plan for Crusader was well underway, and more men and material were approaching the front every day. Rommel wasn't even right that the main enemy were the Australians at Tobruk, because they were in the process of being withdrawn. As a result of political demands through August, September and October, most of the Australians and Indian forces, which had been in Tobruk, were withdrawn and replaced with Scobie's 70th Division. Losses at sea rose alarmingly during September, to the point that Rommel said that if things didn't improve, he'd have to call off the attack on Tobruk completely. Between June and October, 220,000 tons had been lost to British naval activity and air activity. The OKW had also noticed the steady increase in British forces in the Middle East, and concluded in early October that the British would move to relieve Tobruk, and would then transfer these forces to the Caucasus, which was thought to be Britain's main concern. In fact, it was the Italians who correctly guessed that the British were aiming to take Libya. And even Hitler had taken notice of the supply problems. Hitler had been trying to persuade Mussolini to allow German naval and air officers to take part in the Mediterranean War. Finally, at the end of October, Hitler forced Mussolini's hand on the issue, which is why Field Marshal Albert Kessering becomes Commander-in-Chief South and is given command of Flieger Corps 2 and 10. He's ordered to gain air and naval superiority between Italy and North Africa and relieve the supply problems. And of course, Malta was to be attacked. In the meantime, both Axis high commands were telling Rommel to be cautious and to wait until 1942 before mounting another attack. They predicted an improvement in the supply situation by then. And, of course, Rommel took no notice. He intended to attack Tobruk in the third week of November, and he felt that he had to attack before the British attacked him, regardless of the supply situation. This situation was certainly not cleared up by the time Operation Crusader started. Prior to the beginning of Crusader, there were two small British operations designed to distract Rommel's attention. The first was Operation Flipper, launched on the 13th to 14th of November by Keyes's number 11th Scottish Commando. The idea was to land 59 men behind enemy lines from two submarines, HMS Torbay and HMS Talisman, in the Yabel Akdar area, 20 miles west of Apollonia. Once they landed, they would carry out several objectives, all raiding missions, including the Italian HQ at Sirene and the Italian Intelligence Center at Apollonia. But one of them was to assassinate Rommel at the villa in Beda Littoria, or Sidi Rafa, although this particular mission wasn't the main objective. The mission began badly. The men were two hours late boarding the submarines, and some of the tightly packed men had to sleep in the torpedo tubes on an unbearably hot journey. They successfully reached the beach at Shesem el Kelb 
on the 14th of November, when the weather was good. But, for reasons that the sources don't make abundantly clear, they waited until the 15th of November before they attempted a landing. However, by this point the weather had deteriorated. Strong winds and rough seas prevented the submarines from launching the commandos correctly. After hours of battling the waves, much equipment was lost, many of the men didn't get to shore, remaining on the submarine, and at least one commando drowned, as well as two of their Arab guides. As a result of these losses, two of the four objectives had to be abandoned. The men continued onto their objectives, and on the night of the 17th and 18th of November, the attempt is made on Rommel's life. The main objective was actually not the raid on the villa, which was thought to be Rommel's headquarters, but with the bad luck so far, they decided to just go for the villa and take out Rommel. He was to be either captured or killed. Hauptmann Weiss was the German officer in charge of the staff at the villa, although it should have been Rommel's quartermaster general, Major Schleusener, but he was in hospital at Apollonia, suffering from dysentery. Just before 1am on the morning of the 18th of November, the day Operation Crusader began, a commando called Robert Campbell knocked on the villa's door. When a guard, armed only with a bayonet, opened the door, Keyes grappled with him. In the hand-to-hand -hand clash, the guard shouted, alerting the rest of the Germans before being shot by Campbell's Tommy gun. Then a confusing firefight broke out, with machine guns and grenades going off all over the place. It's not clear how, but Keyes was killed, possibly by friendly fire from Campbell's Tommy gun, and Campbell was wounded in the leg, so he had to surrender. The mission was a failure. Doubly so, because Rommel was actually on his way back from Athens at the time, so he wasn't even at the villa. The surviving commandos made it back to the beach, but while they did make contact with the Torbay, the bad weather prevented them from being evacuated. Then Italian troops attacked them at dawn on the 19th of November, so the 22 men that remained decided to split up into small groups and try to make it back to British lines. Out of the six officers and 53 men of number 11 commando who began the raid, only two, Colonel Laycock and Sergeant Terry, got back to Allied lines safely. This was after a lovely 41 day stroll across the desert, although it did rain constantly so food was their main issue, not water. It was then discovered that Rommel had actually moved his HQ from Beda Littoria weeks before, and was nowhere near, so the raid was a complete waste of time. In fact, according to one source, Rommel had never actually used the villa at Beda Littoria as his private accommodation, and had only been there on a few occasions. Rommel's HQ was now at Gambut, between Tobruk and Bardia, 200 miles east of the target villa. The second diversionary operation took place on the night of the 16th, two days before Operation Crusader began. Captain David Sterling's L Detachment of 1st Special Service Brigade, which became 1st SAS Regiment later, parachuted into the desert to raid five airfields near Ghazala to Mimi. Their goal was to try and destroy the new 109F fighters the Germans had deployed to Africa. But again, after they'd taken off, the weather turned sour. The aircraft dropped L Detachments all over the place and of the five parties, only one landed intact and near the target. Of the men who did drop, some broke their necks, others' legs. In fact, one plane had been damaged by anti-aircraft fire with a piece of shrapnel being lodged in the compass. Abandoning the drop, the pilot flew west towards home, but was actually flying in circles until his fuel ran out and he had to make an emergency landing and everyone was captured the next day. The one group that was near the airfield at Tamimi was soaked through after their drop, to the point that their explosives wouldn't work. The commander, a Lieutenant Paddy Main, considered attacking the planes with grenades, but was reluctantly persuaded to rethink the plan. We had a hell of a time talking him out of it, but there was no point getting knocked off in a hopeless cause. You couldn't knock an aircraft out with a grenade. The operation was abandoned and the survivors withdrew, to be picked up by the Long Range Desert Group. Luckily, among the survivors were Captain David Sterling and Lieutenant Paddy Main. 
and both learned their lessons from the raid, which they would apply in future operations. It was not an auspicious beginning for the famous SAS regiment on this, its first operation. So, Rommel survives his assassination attempt and his own raid inside British territory. This is lucky because without this really decisive and action oriented German general, how could the Germans hope to stop the British next episode when Operation Crusader begins? Well, actually, Rommel doesn't do what the British hope he will do, and it's really uncharacteristic of Rommel. Uh, truly bizarre, and really this peculiar reaction to the British offensive cascades. It's the first domino which turns Crusader into what can only be described as one of the most surprising and extraordinary battles in World War II, if not all of military history. And that's not an exaggeration. Thanks for watching, bye for now.